Hi, and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center. My name is Patricia Moore, and I am with NASA's Digital Learning Network, or DLN for short. And the Digital Learning Network connects students and educators utilizing video conferencing and webcasts um, to scientists, engineers, astronauts, and NASA specialists here at NASA. And today, the Digital Learning Network and the Public Affairs Office at Johnson Space Center is collaborating on a very special event that takes together music and the culturals of the international Space Station. So I'd like to welcome everybody here today, and there are many guests on the stage with me that I'd like to introduce. I'd like to begin by introducing our choir from Pearl Hall Elementary in Pasadena, Texas. Um, I'd also like to mention that uh, Pearl Hall is a part of Indi uh, Pasadena's Independent School District, and South Houston High School is one of these high schools that has an experiment on the International Space Station. And so thank you, the choir, for being here. I'd also um, like to introduce uh, Jamie Leupold, who is their educator, and Pat Surface, who's the choir director who's behind the scenes. I'd like to introduce our musicians. We have Sergei Galperin, who is a part of the Houston Symphony, and he's the first violinist, and Kenji Williams, director and violinist of Bella Gaia, and my co-host today, astronaut Katie Coleman. So thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. Now, in addition to the folks here on the stage with us, we have some virtual participants. Our first school I'd like to introduce is Pearl Hall Elementary in Pasadena, Texas. So Pearl Hall, would you please unmute your microphone and say hello to everyone? Ah, well, thank you, Pearl Hall. All right, so next. I'd like to introduce our second participant. It's Tenry University. And Tenry University was crucial in allowing a special Japanese instrument to be flown to the International Space Station. So Tenry University, please unmute your microphone and say hello. All right, all right, so we'll, we'll connect back with Tenry in just a moment. Maybe they may have some audio difficulty. All right, so um, what I'd like to do to begin our program is invite Katie to share with us a little bit about the International Space Station and the project. Well, we're here today basically to play music all around the world. So we're here in Houston, we have a school in Japan, we have a school in Houston, and we have musicians from everywhere, and we're gonna celebrate basically the international nature of the space station. It's built by 16 different countries. And when we're up there as a crew of six, sometimes we have you know, some of the countries represented, sometimes others. And right now we have uh, Koichi Wakata from Japan on the station with two Americans and his three Russian crewmates. And so we're going to celebrate the music of Russia, Japan, America, and whatever else comes to mind. We'll see. Uh, the space station itself is, I, I just, I like to see pictures of it. It looks to me like it's an animation, like this was a cartoon, but that's a real place. I lived there for six months. Koichi Wakata and his crewmates have been up there for almost six as well. And it's an amazing, amazing place. People think, they feel bad for us because going to space, it's, it's pretty small. But actually, when we're up on that space station, it's giant and huge. It's like, that, that picture that you saw, it's like 10 train cars all together. It's the size of a football field. So it's like train cars without, or buses without the seats in them. And in that volume, we can do science experiments. We can, we can do all sorts of things. And we fly from place to place. One of the things that um, I really like to talk about is the science that we do up on the space station. And we've got a great picture of Koichi that shows just why we do science. We do experiments up there that we cannot do down here on the ground. Look at that ball of water. Down here on the ground, it would be a puddle on the ground. And, and so up in space, because it forms a sphere, we get to see what does water really want to do. We get to grow crystals where crystals are growing more perfectly. We get to study combustion where we're looking at candle flames that don't look like this, but actually are round and spherical. And because of that, it lets us study combustion and pollution and how things burn more efficiently up in space. So the reason we do experiments up in space is because we can do things there that we, can, we can't do down here and because the things that we learn up there in space are things that come right back home down here to, to Earth. I've got a couple more pictures to show you. Um, there's one, one of my favorite experiments. It looks uh, 
kind of like a, um, it, it's really just a liquid in a container, but again, we're seeing what do liquids really want to do? You're also seeing what does Karen's hair want to do? <laughs> it's pretty wild. <laughs> um, I, I think it's pretty neat to see how these things act in microgravity. And because the forces are so tiny down here on the Earth, they're hard to study, but up in space it's easier. And so the things that we're learning from the experiment that Karen was doing was, for example, when we're on our way to Mars, I personally would like to know how much gas we have in our tank. Mm -hmm. And if the gas is all floating, well, how are we gonna know that? Well, in the experiment Karen was doing, when we changed the angle of the container just by like three degrees, so small you can't even see it, all of that liquid, all of our fuel is gonna be in one place in the container. That's so important to learn about. So we're learning all sorts of things that we can't hear or find out down here on the ground. And we're learning about ourselves, about our bodies and how people live in space. Up on the space station, it's our test bed for exploration because we are going back to the moon, to asteroids and onto Mars, and we're not ready. We are not ready yet. And that's why we have the space station and we do these experiments. One of the things we need to find out is what happens to people up there. You know, we don't walk around on our feet. Our brains don't get that message that they need to build bone. And so we actually lose a lot of bone and muscle while we're up there. Um, I think we have a picture of Koichi on our exercise machine. And by doing exercise up there, it turns out that we don't actually lose as much bone and muscle. And in fact, I can speak from my own results. I came back without losing, I, I did lose some bone, but I came back really with the same amount that I left with. And here's the secret, exercise. Yes. Exercise. So we're learning all about how to, keep, to build uh, strong bones for Mars. And at the same time, we need strong bones down here too. These kids need strong bones. And it comes down to exercise and other things. So the experiments, again, that we do up there, we're getting to understand how to do them. Or we're, we're understanding more about life down here. And uh, last but not least, I'd just like to show a picture of Koichi and his crew because we're gonna meet Koichi, but the other folks are probably pretty busy doing uh, science experiments. But um, let's see, uh, so we've got Koichi there. You see the six of them. We go up in groups of three. And then when we get up there, there'll already be three people up there. So Koichi is going to come home with his two Russian cosmonaut crewmates. And when, uh, after he lands, another three-person crew will go up and will be a six-person crew again. So at any one moment, there are always six people doing science, making amazing things happen, and being just plain old people and doing things like playing music on the space station. Great. Thank you, Katie. So now I want to um, kind of talk about what brought us all here together today. And that individual is Jamie Leupold, and she has a very special program at Pearl Hall Elementary called Building Cultural Bridges. So Jamie, why don't you share with us a little bit about your project? Okay. It is called Building Cultural Bridges, and this whole idea started whenever my teaching partner, uh, who is my mom, we started talking about how can we make the music education requirements for Texas more relevant to kids in our community. And so we thought, well, if we have these musicians come to the school and people from these international countries, this would be really fabulous. So we approached NASA, we approached the Houston Symphony, other arts organizations who had an international presence in Houston. And they all agreed to give this a try about 16 years ago to bring one or two guests to the school per year to see about letting kids interview them, about their careers, their culture, and their literature and folk music, because those are things that people from all countries have in common. And now here we are 16 years later and about 75 guests from 27 countries have come to the school and, is, and they are interviewed by children, uh, teams of third or fourth graders right there. I mean, you're seeing David St. Jacques from, from this Canadian Space Agency who was just at our school this year and astronauts from every major space agency of the International Space Station Partners has been to the school. And the children learned their folk songs. And Koichi was one of the ones who came to our school. He's been there twice. And on his first visit, um, they, he brought his culture to us for the first time for kids in Texas to experience a, a deep traditional Japanese culture. And he brought um, his book. Uh, Chris Hadfield found it in Japan. And so today we're very excited to celebrate that with those of you who are in, in Japan today joining us at Tenry University. Um, to have this unique instrument um, bringing to life the cultures and sharing it across the world 
through the curriculum we study at school and it brings such richness to our school and so the books they shared we also have the the copies of them in our school and so this is Koichi's favorite book from his childhood that we have at the school for kids to look at and as well as learning the folk songs and so we partnered with Houston Symphony and um, this brought our first experience with Russian culture to our kids. And Sergei Galperin, who is a Russian violinist, a Russian-born violinist for the Houston Symphony, came and performed music for our students and shared uh, the music of his culture. And we've done many, many performances blending the arts and sciences of the, our curriculum in our schools and blending the arts and sciences of music moving from STEM to bringing in the arts and moving that into STEAM, which I know something we're hearing a little bit more coming from headquarters at NASA about in the education program. Very exciting. So um, I'm going to ask Sergey if he would please to talk a little bit about his experiences with our programs at school, with the Houston Symphony, and the, the partnerships they've had for a long time with NASA. Well, I, little did I know what I got myself into <laughs> <laughs> when Jamie invited me to play for her school. But it's a terrific project. I'm very proud to be part of it. I was uh, born in Moscow, went to uh, move to New York City and went to Juilliard School and joined the Houston Symphony 17 years ago. And uh, this sort of trifecta that we are doing with the Houston Symphony, NASA, and Cultural Bridges is really a, a fantastic project. So the Houston Symphony and NASA has had a long history of commitment uh, uh, where the technology means the, meets the arts. Last year we went to uh, Great Britain and performed the HD Odyssey all over um, that great nation to, to, to such a success that folks in Cleveland, in Sydney, in Rotterdam, all over the world want to see that DVD. They want to see what NASA does. They want to see how Houston Symphony does. And so we are, I think, f going forward with more projects between the Houston Symphony and NASA, especially during our centennial season with the Houston Symphony. So that's, th those are the two links that are very important. We're close. We're only an hour away from the hall to the, to, the, to the command center here. And then the culture bridges that third aspect of this co collaboration is, is terrific. I mean, this young lady over here deserves a, a, a medal of honor. I mean, she brings these kids uh, who would have otherwise never have seen uh, uh, all of you and, and have been able to participate in such a magnificent collaboration. And so if a Nobel Prize or a composer <laughs> or an astronaut will come from her institution, this is the person to send the, uh, the, the, the congrats letters to. So, well, thank you. Yeah, the collaborations have been wonderful, and it's been a, a triple whammy here for us having three music educators. I know that our Seth Buell is running the show back at Pearl Hall Elementary, and we're very excited to share students here and students at our school with the world and with NASA and the symphony. Well, that's a perfect segue. Why don't we go ahead and prepare for our first song? So, Squire, if, if you're ready, and Sergey, perhaps you would like to share with us about our first song, a Kalinka. Uh, Kalinka is a very, very, very Russian song. And for those on the space station that speak Russian, добрый день, добрый вечер. Я не знаю, какое у вас сейчас там время дня. Uh, uh, that was not bad words. I just welcomed <laughs> them into our discussion. And uh, uh, it was written back in 1860. And I don't think the, fo the gentleman who wrote it, uh, as often it happens, had the idea that what he wrote as an entertainment folk song, folk song became a standard uh, for, the, for, for the Russian people up to this date. So we're going to play for you probably the most famous Russian song that you've heard uh, uh, in, 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 in sporting events when the ballerinas or, or, or figure skaters dance. You've heard it during uh, 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 trips to Russia when Russian bear dances. I mean, it is the quintessential Russian song, Kalinka.
good. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Excellent wow. job, choir. Yeah. All right, so in a, a few minutes, we are going to have a very special opportunity to speak with Commander Koichi Wakata on the International Space Station. So while we're waiting for that to occur, I'd like to give students at Pearl Hall and also at Tenry University a chance to ask Katie a few questions about her experiences in flight. So we are going to begin with our first school. So Pearl Hall, if you could please unmute your microphone and ask your first question. Hi, my name is Laura, and my question is, what is the best adventure you've experienced as an astronaut? Well, Laura, some people think that launch is the, is, the, is the most important thing that we do, and it is actually like really, really, really exciting. But I will tell you that living on the International Space Station for almost six months, I loved it up there, and if I could have brought my family with me, I have a son who's about 13. He was 10 when I went. If I could have bought, brought him and my husband with me, I wouldn't have wanted to come home. It was the best adventure ever, and I can't wait to go back. All right. Thank you, Pearl Hall. Let's go to Tenry University. Please unmute your microphone and ask your first question. It is said that staying in space can give rise to a sense of awe for certain individuals. Did you feel did you feel any spiritual or religious feeling? Any spiritual or religious uh, feeling? You know, it's going to be different for every single person. I, you can plan what you'll feel like. You can think you know what it might feel like, but then when you're actually in a space station orbiting the Earth, looking down, seeing your country. And in fact, I studied very often in Japan for my mission, so I was very, very happy to look down and see Japan. When you look down and you realize that everyone you know is down there, it's wonderful to be up in space. And at the same time, it's, it's, um, I, I felt so, so privileged to have that viewpoint and actually to realize that I don't actually come from a country I come from the Earth, and that our Earth is in the neighborhood of space, and it's a wonderful place. Thank you. All right, Pearl Hall, you're up next, please. Hi, I am Daisy, and my question is, we have rules we have to follow at school. What rules do you have to follow while you're living on the ISS? Rules. Well, you know, we don't, we don't actually have to follow any rules at all. <laughs> Not true. You know, we have to follow rules just like you do. And up there, it, it, it's really clear that safety is the most important thing because we're in kind of a dangerous place, right? And it, it makes me realize that being, being, following rules, there's a reason for them. And even though I actually don't always feel like following the rules, <laughs> It's plain old important, and it just has to be done, and you just follow the rules and get that part done and get on with what, whatever work you're trying to do there. So we have lots of rules up there as well, and pretty much we have to do what we're told. Even Commander Wakata, I think, will tell you that. <laughs> All right, Tendry University, please um, tell us your next, your next question. Hi, my name is Megumi, and my question is, is there anything that you thought was an advantage or disadvantage about being a female astronaut? So being a, being a woman astronaut up there, it's just nice to have lots of different kinds of people up there. I will say in general, um, we can be smaller than some of the guys. And down here, that can be a disadvantage where I'm always having to stand on a step to be tall enough, right? Um, <laughs> but then up in space, I'm tall enough. So there's advantages and disadvantages. But what I find is sometimes the equipment is actually made for people who are bigger than I am. Or I'm left-handed, and I find the equipment is made for people who use their right hand more. And what I think is important is having lots of women and minorities going to school, getting the tools that they need to be the engineers to design that space station and to design the rockets that we'll bring to Mars and the place we'll live on Mars. I want women and other minorities, minorities to design those things so that when they get there, everything will fit them. 
All right, great. All right, we're going to take another question from Pearl Hall Elementary. What's your next question for Katie? My name is Myra, and my question is, if you could be the first person on Mars, what would you want to take with you? Well, you know, I started to think, well, okay, there would be my son and my husband, but chances are they're going to be too heavy, and I can't bring those things. <laughs> you know, I'd love to say I'd bring my flute, you know, which I have here, or that I would um, bring some things like that that I just love, but first we're going to bring the equipment that we need to explore Mars, to live there safely, and to be able to return home and to send data home so that everyone back on Earth can understand what it's like on Mars so that we can then send more people safely and then go to places even beyond Mars. So I bring the things that we need. Good. All right, well, we have a few minutes before uh, we're going to be connected with Koichi. Okay. So I actually have a question for you. When okay. you were on the International Space Station, did you make a new discovery or did someone within your team make a new discovery in space? Well. Here's something I think un unexpected about new discoveries is we, we see TV programs, we think that one person makes a discovery. People make discoveries together when they work together. And so we actually did have a, a pretty exciting discovery when I was on board in terms of fluids and figuring out what do liquids really want to, d to do. And I mentioned it earlier, understanding more things about how to design that zero-g fuel tank so that we have enough fuel to get to All Mars right. so we know how much we have. That's great. Thank you, Katie. All right. It looks like we're going to begin our event. So let's stand by just a few seconds, and we're going to be joined with Can Commander Koichi Wakata on the International Space Station. All right, well, Commander Kawada, uh, Koichi Wakata is on the International Space Station traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. They experience a sunrise or a sunset every 45 minutes. And so it's a beautiful, beautiful experience for the astronauts. And we're very fortunate to have him join us today. It's not every day you get to speak to an astronaut on the International Space Station. So we're very, very fortunate. Can we hear Koichi yet? All right. We're, we're waiting. We're standing by. We're waiting Station, for Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, I am ready for the event. Woohoo! Music and space participants, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. All right. ISS Commander Koichi Wakata, this is Patricia Moore at Johnson Space Center. How do you hear me? Patricia, uh, I have you loud and clear. I'm glad to join you for this event. Great. Thank you, Koichi. Here at the Johnson Space Center, we have several folks on, on stage with us. We've got the students here at Pearl Hall Elementary. We have uh, Katie at Coleman here. We have um, their educator, uh, Jamie Leupold. We have Sergey Galperin, and we also have Kenji Williams. And so I wanted to let you know, everyone we have, and I'd, I'd like to give you a chance to share with us what's going on on the space station, a little bit about the special show instrument you have on the uh, International Space Station, and then I hear you're going to play a du duet for us as well. Yes, thank you very much for helping out. And uh, yeah, this is the uh, yeah this is the uh, musical instrument show, and. Uh, this was uh, launched on the SpaceX-3 uh, Dragon spacecraft. Actually, until I got to space, I uh, never saw or uh, touched this instrument. So it's uh, quite an honor uh, to be able to see this and then uh, play this musical instrument. Well, thank you, Koichi. So I'd like uh, to give Kenji an opportunity to, to talk with you a little bit. Um, you're going um, to, to play a special duet for us. So maybe you want to start off by talking a little bit about the instrument, and then maybe um, Kenji can jump in and you guys can get started. OK. Yeah, Kenji, uh, nice to talk with you. And uh, this is a musical instrument show. Actually, this is designed to uh, look like a mythical uh, bird, a phoenix, uh, as it rests with its uh, 360 uh, wings folded. The uh, instrument show, uh, show was uh, first introduced to Japan uh, from China uh, back in the 8th century. And then uh, actually the uh, sound making uh, uh, mechanism of uh, show 
is uh, pretty much the same as uh, that of a harmonica. And the, uh, the spirit of uh, Sho uh, represents the, uh, the spirit of fire rising from the uh, ground, from the earth to space. So uh, I am so glad that I am uh, going to be able to play this musical instrument uh, together with Kenji. Well, Koichi, I'm uh, extremely honored to uh, perform with you and collaborate with you. And uh, thank you for sharing the information about the uh, show instrument. Um, before we get started, is it possible maybe that uh, you could just test the tone and the microphone? OK, I'll uh, do that now. OK, here we go. Were you Amazing. able to uh, hear the, uh, the Amazing. tone? Amazing. Amazing. Very good. Koichi, how do you Amazing. feel when you play that in space? It's a very soothing uh, sound, and uh, it's really a comfortable tone, and uh, it really fits this uh, microgravity floating in the microgravity. All right. Great. Can you would you like? Yes. So, um, Kochi, I would, I would like to perform uh, with you. And uh, just a note about the toning of this, I had to tune my violin down to 430 uh, hertz to match the tuning of the show, which is a very particular tuning. And uh, given that the show is an instrument to tune the cosmos traditionally, um, I would like to dedicate this uh, collaboration and performance as a prayer for our planet Earth for our family and our uh, loved ones in healing uh, uh, our, our loved ones and our family and our, and our planet Earth. So um, shall we uh, get started now?
<laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Wow. That was marvelous. Thank you, Koichi. That was amazing. Uh, wow. Thank you. Koichi, we... Thank you, Kenji. And we have several schools connected. We have Pearl Hall and Tenry University who would like an opportunity to speak with you and ask you a few questions. I'd like to first go to Pearl Hall. Please um, mute your microphone and ask Kenji your first two questions. Hi, my name is Denise Rodriguez, and my question is, how, how are the musical instruments, um, how are musical instruments adjusted in order to play on the ISS? What are the differences between playing on Earth and in space? Well, wow, that's a very good question. Here on board the International Space Station, we have air, and the uh, the pressure of the air is uh, pretty much same as the uh, the pressure on the ground. So the uh, the acoustic characteristics of the air that we breathe here inside of the space station is the same as on the ground. As a result, sound of uh, our voice, uh, you know, transmits very similar. That's why we do not need to make any special adjustment of uh, many uh, uh, musical instruments that we have. And then uh, so uh, we can play it and listen to the musical instruments uh, like on the ground here on board the International Space Station. Hi, my name is Eric, and my question is, do you believe that the existence of instruments and music on the ISS increases the longevity and health of the mission and crew? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And yes, I uh, strongly believe that uh, music uh, gives us a sensation of relaxation. Um, in space as well as on the ground and then uh, listening to music playing music on board the space station will make our life on board the space station more enjoyable and it's the same on the ground and uh, here uh, in the very uh, uh, secluded area of the space station where we have only six crew members and uh, the music is a really uh, good uh, psychological support for all of us All right, so Tenry University, um, their first question is, how will 3D printing support future human missions in space? Yeah, um, 3D print printing uh, technology uh, will uh, enable us to have very efficient uh, production of uh, parts that are used uh, for rockets and uh, human spacecraft. And uh, right now on board the space station, we don't have 3D uh, printing machines, but uh, there are a lot of parts that are already used in, uh, in the space station program that came from this uh, 3D printing uh, uh, production. And uh, maybe uh, when we go to Mars uh, or asteroid, probably Mars, uh, uh, astronauts may be making our own uh, parts that are needed to continue the space flight and the activities on Mars using the technology of uh, 3D pr printing productions. Here, Tenry, let's give you guys another shot. Please unmute your microphone and ask your ne next question, please. microphone, こんにちは。私の名前はヨウスイです。ジャクサでは宇宙ステーションで実験を行っており、半導体物質が微重力状態でどのように成長し結晶化するかを研究しています。この研究では地上での科学技術向上に役立ちますでしょうか。JAXA has an experiment on the space station that is looking at 
how semiconductor materials grow and crystallize in microgravity. Will this research help improve technology on Earth? Hi, Kokusai uh, え、半導体の結晶成長実験です。そしてこの微小重量環境を使って、え、均質な良質な半導体の材料を作ることができますので、え、こういった研究を通して地上での半導体の、え、材料の開発に役に立つような、え、成果が出てきています。ちょうど今
for example, to Mars, uh, astronauts will be able to make uh, new parts uh, utilizing the uh, 3D printing technology that are needed for repair and maintenance of a spacecraft or a space structure that we will have on board uh, on Mars surface. So uh, it's a very unique and a very uh, uh, interesting and uh, very important technology. Thank you. And thank you. We have time for a one last quick question from Pearl Hall Elementary. Hi, my name is German, and my question is, what have you or your crew members learned about living in space for longer times that will help Scott Kelly when he gets to live on ISS for a whole year? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I think we are gaining uh, a lot of uh, experience in the, uh, the countermeasures to cope with a situation where we lose uh, bone density and muscle strength. And uh, exercise is very important. We're gaining uh, a lot of experience of a very uh, efficient way to conduct ex uh, exercise during the flight. And that kind of a data will uh, help develop uh, uh, exercise protocol that will be used for long duration, longer duration space flight like Scott Kelly's uh, uh, and Amisha Kurnienko's uh, one year flight. So uh, this kind of experiment experience and also uh, we know how important food is and then some other psychological support tools are uh, for a long flight. So these kind of operational experience that we are having now on board the International Space Station will benefit uh, for the uh, longer duration space flight. Thank you, Koichi, and thank you for joining us today. Would you like to say goodbye to all of our friends here on Earth? Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it was truly a pleasure uh, to be able to play this musical instrument and uh, answering your wonderful questions. And I look forward to uh, having more opportunity to be able to, to, to join you in the future and talk about the experience that I had on board the International Space Station. And thank you again. Everybody wave goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Sayonara. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. All right, that was wonderful. What an amazing oh, yeah. experience getting okay. to talk to Koichi on the International Space Station. And thank you, Kenji, for that beautiful music. Thank you. It's an honor. <laughs> All right. Well, we have a very special opportunity to kind of sing a song on behalf of Koichi. Um, Jamie, why don't you share with us about our next song? Yes. One of the things that our guests for the Building Cultural Bridges program do is to bring their culture to us through music. And so when Kuichi came, his song that he shared was his favorite piece of music from his childhood called Usagi Usagi, translated into English is Rabbit Rabbit. And so we, and it's about the moon, which is a, a big important part of what we're studying here at NASA. So we'll perform Usagi Usagi.
Um, obviously, music is a really important part of our life here on Earth and, of course, on the International Space Station. And, Katie, I would really like for you to share with us um, some of the instruments that have been on board the space station and maybe some of your personal experiences. Well, I, th I think some of you know that I, I play the flute, and you know I've done that since I was a kid, but I wasn't a professional flute player. I just like to play, and I like to play with people. When I went up to the space station and I had a little room to bring a few things, I did bring my flute. In fact, it's actually um, this one right here. And it's been uh, 93 million miles, wow. I think, something <laughs> like that. It went around quite a And in fact, I brought uh, several other flutes up to the space station as well because it was important to me to, to share my space station experience in that way. Um, I think we've got some neat video of just mm -hmm. my instruments and other, and other folks. Uh, and I, I'll just kind of talk through it while we watch. Um, this. I love just showing people that it's a different world up there. And when you saw Koichi tossing the show back and forth and just kind of tumbling around, this is a duet that I played with Mr. Ian Anderson of the musical group Jethro Tull. He was the person that brought the flute to rock music. And so it, we played a duet, and it was actually the first duet between Earth and space. Wow. So I don't mean to show you up, Kenji. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but we've had a number of people bring instruments up and even just, you know, listening to music, having fun together, having fun with your friends on the ground. This is part of a music video called uh, World by Five, Five for Fighting, where it said, what kind of world do you want? And, and that's just something that's really important for all of us to think about. And I think um, when we get together and we play music, this is myself uh, and the, the Chieftains, a, a group called the Chieftains. I brought a penny whistle and a 150-year-old flute up to the space wow. station uh, for that group. And we're playing with the Houston Symphony. And it, to me, it was just, it was important to play together. Um, the fact that I, I played their instruments up in space and then I brought them home and I got to talk with them and play with them. And, and if you see me right here, I'm playing a duet with Mr. Matt Malloy. And I will tell you that I'm very nervous. And, and, and I think it's really important for our students here and for people who play instruments to realize that you don't have to be the best in the whole world. You just have to want to share and then it takes a certain amount of being brave. You know, here's Chris Hadfield playing the guitar. You know, he's a wonderful guitar player and singer, songwriter. Um, is he the best in the world? Well, probably not, but was he willing to be brave and share? He was, and in fact, here we are playing. It's our group that we play together with Chris on the ground, Bandela. We're playing with the Houston Symphony, with the Chieftains, and we're playing Moon Dance. And so Chris was on the space station. We were in Symphony Hall right here in Houston, and together we played music together, just, just like Koichi and Kenji just did. And wow. one of the earlier questions that we had was about whether it, there is something spiritual or, or just a, a sense of awe that you would have in, in being up on the space station. And I don't think it's just because I've been there, but when Kenji and Koichi played and we watched the video of sailing over the earth, mm -hmm. And, and video inside the space station and, and Koichi floating around. And I think Koichi was actually entranced when he played that instrument. Played longer than he yeah, I mean, I, I think, think he's he, getting into it. You yeah. know, <laughs> I, I think it, it just, there's something special that happened. You know, that moment yeah. live together, even though he was on the space station going 17,500 miles an hour, even if you can't be physically close, you can be together in spirit. Mm -hmm. And as we travel further and further, I think that that's really more and more important. And, and one of the ways, actually, just for me, in, in, anyway, um, not to be you know, lonely, mm -hmm. was to put on music that my group would play, when we would play together, mm -hmm. that Bandela would play. I would put that music on, and I would go up to the, cu the cupola, which is in the middle of our space station. So people are sleeping on either end of the space station. <laughs> that means that the cupola is a, is a reasonable place to play. You're not going to wake anybody mm -hmm. up. It was usually nighttime. And I would open the window shutters look at the earth, listen to my, my friends back on earth playing music and play along, and we were together in spirit. Wow. And I just think it happens every time you get brave and you play. And all of us that play, I think, are, you know, have to be a little brave to play. And I, I very much congratulate our choir today for being brave and 
standing up in front of everyone and saying, I'm proud just to share. So I, I just music is special, and it's, it's certainly special on the space station. It is. And um, I know there's been several musical instruments on the space station. You mentioned your flute and, what, and the instruments you brought. Um, can you think of any others that have been in space? Well, we've had a keyboard. You saw Luca with the keyboard. I wanted to find it before the shuttle mission came up, because Greg Johnson from SDS-134 plays the keyboards. So I looked on the inventory management system for keyboard. Of course, like hundreds of keyboards showed up, like 60. Not hundreds, but 60, yeah. because every computer has a keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> but then I looked at the locations, and there was one that was stored in a really big place. And sure enough, you know, behind this big rack was the keyboard. Uh, Don Pettit made a didgeridoo. We've had several guitars. Uh, there's been a trumpet. In fact, wow. uh, Frank Culbertson, I think, played taps, unfortunately, after 9-11. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yep. There are special ways to express yourself, and even if we don't bring musical instruments, there will be music Make on that space music. station. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you. Well, we have one final piece uh, to, to share with you today. So, Jamie, why don't you share with us about our next song, Oh Susanna? Yes. Oh Susanna was brought to our Building Cultural Bridges program by astronaut commander Dan Burbank. And Dan shared with our students that he felt that music and literature were two of the most important things we have because they tell others about us. And I think that's one thing that, that music is doing in connecting us with other cultures of the space station program and connects also with, for our students and for students in any school in any country to connect an integrated curriculum and to better make it an artful way to present information and connect us to each other, to our curriculum, which is what this entire program today has been doing. So we would like to share um, James Taylor's version, which was taught to us by Dan Burbank, um, of Oh Susanna. Katie is going to play some jazz flute part around with the, the interlude. So without further ado, here's an American folk song, Oh Susanna.
Thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful experience for us all, and I'm really uh, happy that we were able to join so many people together to put together the Music in Space event today. So I'd like to begin by thanking all the folks behind the scenes here at Johnson Space Center who helped produce the event for us today. And I'd like to thank Kenji and Katie and Jamie and Sarah Gay and um, our choir director, Pat Surface, who's behind the scenes still, um, for being a part of the program. And of course, the students at Pearl Hall Elementary um, are virtual participants, and then Tenry University for, for helping uh, get the show to the International Space Station. We really appreciate all of your support. And a big thanks to our amazing choir. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, if any of you are interested in being a part of a digital learning network event, I encourage you to visit our website at dln.nasa.gov. And to all of you watching on the DL Info channel and on NASA television, on behalf of everyone, thank you for joining the Music in Space program. Bye. Bye.